we are given a very wrong notion that all religions are same and equal. They are not. The teachings of every religion uh, is distinctly different. I wouldn't say some religions are violent and some are nonviolent. That would be making it too simplistic. But the context of violence is very specific in every religion. And that specificity in Islam is that you can kill kafirs. So when the month of Ramadan is over, Ramadan in the Indian subcontinent, many people call it Ramzan. That's the holy month. That is the only time when killing is forbidden. You cannot kill at that time. But otherwise, you are entitled to kill kafirs. First of all, try to convert them. And if they do not uh, submit to their God called Allah, then you are entitled to kill them. I had been triggered by this topic uh, when the news came, very disturbing news in November of a murder that had happened in May by a man, a Muslim man, that religion must be named. And he not only murdered his girlfriend, a Hindu, but severed her body, dismembered it into 35 different parts and spread it across Delhi. They are originally from a place near Mumbai, but they moved to Delhi some time ago. And uh, before that, when Shraddha, the girl, the woman, uh, disclosed this uh, decision of hers uh, to her parents, expectedly they protested vehemently and she did not listen. That also had a very disturbing element about it. There was this uh, editorial called With No Shraddha for Knowledge of Religions. So I, you know, picked the name from uh, Shraddha Waka. Uh, and uh, she was the victim. And first of all, I begin with that part where uh, she defied her parents. And when I discussed this issue over Twitter spaces with a lot of friends and acquaintances and other pro-Hindu people, a lot of parents threw up saying that uh, today's generation does not listen to parents. What can we do? now? The first thing that struck me when they objected was the fact that a 20 or 21 year old woman, I wouldn't call her a girl anymore. She is a woman. Now that is not the time when one must, uh, you know, start telling her what to do and what not to do. The time for that has passed. You know, uh, when a woman is 21 years old, that is not the time ideal time at least, when parents start telling her what to do and what not to do. There was a time when she was five, when she was 10, when she was 15, when this thing should have been told to her. What is that thing? That is give her some knowledge about civilizations of the world. And it is absolutely essential that the education that she comes back with from her school is verified for truth we are given a very wrong notion that all religions are same and equal. They are not. The teachings of every religion uh, is distinctly different. I wouldn't say some religions are violent and some are nonviolent. That would be making it too simplistic. But the context of violence is very specific in every religion. And that specificity in Islam is that you can kill kafirs. So when the month of Ramadan is over, Ramadan in the Indian subcontinent, many people call it Ramzan. That's the holy month. That is the only time when killing is forbidden. You cannot kill at that time. But otherwise, you are entitled to kill kafirs. First of all, try to convert them. And if they do not uh, submit to their God called Allah, then you are entitled to kill them. But anyway, the point is, if at the age of five or 10, if five is too early than 10 or 15, if you tell your child 
that there is this religion, perhaps the second largest in terms of numbers of uh, number of followers across the world that sanctions its followers to kill non-believers, specifically speaking, those who do not believe or those who do not submit to Allah and his prophet Muhammad. Now, that is the killing part that very often does not happen. Well, this is this uh, Shraddha story was a story of crime. And so right after the uh, editorial that I wrote with no Shraddha for knowledge of religions, expectedly, a large section of the mainstream media did what uh, I feared and many others had feared they would do. Immediately, they dug out similar criminal stories, uh, similar crime stories, showing other murderers who had severed the body of the victim into several parts and uh, dispose them off. So, but this, while being a very clear attempt to, uh, you know, drive home the point that Muslims alone are not criminals of this type, what the media failed to do, and they will keep failing no matter how hard they try. Any Hindu or Christian or Sikh criminal that they found who had severed the body of his girlfriend did not have a similar record of purposely trapping women of another religion one after another as this particular criminal, the Muslim guy did. You know, everybody who knew him from his Mumbai days have testified to the fact that he had targeted several women, all from the Hindu faith, and some of them even visited the rented accommodation in Mehroli of Delhi, even while the body was uh, you know, kept in a fridge inside that house, uh, severed into several parts. So this Aftab Punawala, Aftab Asin Punawala, this guy had an agenda. That agenda must be understood. And uh, this is where uh, I think we should also share some slides. Yeah, this is the uh, editorial uh, that I wrote. And uh, right after that, there was a barrage of news reports in the mainstream media saying there are similar criminals from other communities. How predictable and how awful an argument. This Afta Punawala has had a unique record just as several other uh, love jihadis who target women on purpose. And now, mercifully, we cannot even say that the whole uh, of media is bad. At least the Hindi language media has started acknowledging love jihad. You will find a lot of stories in Dainik Jagran, in Dainik Bhaskar, even sometimes in Navbharat uh, times and Hindustan, sometimes, very rarely. But uh, very often, you will see them on Dainik Jagran, sometimes on Ajtak website as well they have begun acknowledging love jihad. But the English language media in India continues to live in denial. So that is the section of media that even our children are most exposed to. So it is not only just the school education that you must verify every day or at least every week. Check out the books, especially the social sciences book, Book of History, what part of the seventh century Arabia does your child know about? That is the time when Islam was founded. And Islam was founded gradually. It did not happen overnight. Although, you know, the God of Islam and the God of Christianity say that the world, the universe was created in six days, blah, blah. The religion took shape slowly and a lot of battles and wars were fought in the process. So uh, that will come subsequently, but uh, what especially girls in every Hindu household, Christian household, Sikh household, Parsi household know is how Islam treats women. And before I start that, I must make a point, do not target Muslims because you will get into a logical fallacy. The logical fallacy is 
the moment you give an example of aftab punawala somebody give, will give an example of apj abdul kalam and say look there are good muslims as well so your argument gets defeated you must target islam rather than muslims and continuously harp on this till cows come home because this is going to be a long process now we hear of a community called ex muslims let there be more ex muslims because if you keep shaming the people uh you keep shaming uh, the followers of this diabolical religion that says and now i come to the next slide and i am not quoting from any israeli run website any hindu run website or anybody who hates islam this is from corpus.quran.com the website is run by very knowledgeable muslims and in the quran in surah or surat an-nisa chapter 4 number 34 it says that you can beat your wife gently just take care of the fact that she she is not irreparably damaged but you can beat her still now what kind of a god teaches people to beat their wives and how can anybody who says he is a muslim or she is a muslim say that i am 99% muslim or i am 50% muslim i do not believe in these parts because islam is very clear about it either you believe in the whole of it or you are not a muslim and therefore these parts cannot be discarded this part these parts cannot be disowned they can't even be contextualized uh, there is a section that i'll come to subsequently that can be contextualized like when there is a war there are certain uh, you know exceptional situations but here as far as the life of a household is concerned there is no context of war it says that if your wife does not behave you can beat her and nowhere in the quran it tells the wife if your husband does not behave you can beat him too there is no such provision in any case physical violence is unacceptable but this is particularly targeted at women now think about it you as a parent are telling your little girl this is a religion that has a teaching like this growing up one day you will perhaps marry if you do would you like to marry a man who follows a religion that teaches this she will be so terribly scared forget about marriage even when a muslim man makes advances towards her maybe in her college maybe in her workplace she will be repelled by the very thought you know those that thought of her childhood when her father or mother gave her this lesson will haunt her now i come to the next one uh this is this was surah an-nisa chapter 4 uh, verse 34 now surah al-mu'minun this is another thing if the previous uh, verse did not scare the girl enough come to this section this tells muslim men who all they can have sex with this is surah al-mu'minun chapter 23 verse 6 and it uses in the english translation a very floral way of saying an obnoxious thing it says that you can have sex with anybody whom your right hand possesses now what is the meaning of whom your right hand possesses you may have also heard zakir nayak say this in some of uh, his videos and very proudly he says this whom your right hand possesses is nothing but a sex slave and now gradually the context begins the context here is not only based on quran but also on hadith uh, let me uh, tell the uninitiated part of the audience that to be a muslim you must believe wholly not partially in three things first of all the quran which is supposed to be the word of allah their god uh, secondly it is hadith hadith is a compilation of things that uh, muhammad their prophet spoke or he did which were recorded by his companions singular is hadith plural in arabic is ahadith uh, sometimes when i write on islam and people are 
surprised by the word ahadith they think it's a typo it's not a typo it's uh, it's uh, you know plural number bahuvachan uh, in urdu it is called jama singular is wahid and plural is jama so this uh, ahadith is hadiths so many hadiths together is uh, a hadith so it is also it also finds mention in a hadith and they are all authenticated hadiths uh, let me uh, you know issue another disclaimer here that very often some scholars uh, say that uh, hadith is not a reliable document and i'll i'll name some, name someone very big who said this uh, he was the founder of aligarh muslim university sir sayyed ahmed khan but if you go to pakistan today or you talk to pakistanis today you will come to know that he is not a respected figure at all no matter what muslim scholars in india say about him because he disowned the hadith and academically speaking the error margin in hadith is 3500 plus minus 3500 that means there are about 3500 things attributed to muhammad which he may or may not be responsible for nevertheless when you see a hadith of sahih bukhari it is reliable and therefore any hadith that i quote will be of sahih bukhari it is unquestionable it has been authenticated because sahih bukhari his actual name is only bukhari sahih means he is right so bukhari went across although he uh, you know uh, uh, he became active much after muhammad was gone he became active in compiling all that muhammad had said and done he traveled extensively finding out uh, the surviving or descendants of the companions uh, of muhammad and in that course he uh, also cross verified whatever he was told that muhammad had said or he had done with others who knew muhammad so this is the most authentic hadith what happens in hadith in this particular context which is in consonance with what you see on your screen surah al muminun is that there were different tribes living around the house of khadija khadija happens to be the first wife of muhammad she was a business woman she was a trader and to trade in that era you know that the sea route was extensively used but to reach the sea they had to cross the settlements that were partly jewish that were partly christian and there were also settlements that had other uh, arab pagan faiths so uh, very often there used to be fight uh, while uh, they would take their goods to the sea and uh, on a couple of occasions they signed an agreement the different tribes signed an agreement not to fight but the agreement was not honored and then there were wars so among different wars there was a war called banu quraiza the war with banu quraiza this all this happened uh, much later in muhammad's prophethood when he was joined by ali his son in law so when these wars were fought muslims won uh, so muslims were then those who had in arabia already begun following muhammad they were the initial muslims so they won th those battles when they came back from the battlefield and reported it to muhammad that the men in these settlements have been vanquished they have been defeated taken prisoners or killed what do we do with women and children so that is the context where the hadith comes this is the pamphlet or leaflet that tehreek e taliban pakistan had left behind in a school of peshawar in december 2014 after killing children of pakistani army soldiers i'll shortly uh, you know read out what is written in urdu and also translate it uh, into english but taking that surat al muminun and this hadith together they were told that the women can be your commodity 
that is what is meant by whom your right hand possesses you may use them as sex slaves as for children you may either use them in bonded labor or you may kill them now i am uh, reading this uh, thing that is uh, written uh, you know you can see it on your screen this script in urdu i'll first read it and then translate it it reads taliban ke tarjuman muhammad khurasani ka kehna hai ki mujahideen ko hidayat di gayi thi ki wo sirf bare bachchon ka qital kare qital is plural of qatl qatl is murder peshawar ki karwai sunnat e nabi ke ayn mutabik hai kyunki nabi karim ne bhi बानो कुरैजा के किताल के वक्त यही शर्त मुबारक आयद की थी कि सिर्फ उन बच्चों को कत्ल किया जाए जिनके जेर नफबाल दिखाई देना शुरू हो गए हैं बच्चों और औरतों का कत्ल आईने रसूल पाक की तालीम के मुताबिक है एतराज करने वाले सही बुखारी जिल्द पांच हदीस एक सौ अड़तालीस का मुताला करे now i'm translating it this is taliban spokesman mohammad khurasani who says his holy warriors were instructed to fight or battle with older children alone the peshawar action is exactly in accordance with the practices of the prophet as the kind prophet had laid down the same auspicious condition during the battle of banu quraiza a jewish tribe of that era settled in madina that only such children be killed whose pubic hair had appeared the killing of children and women is precisely in conformity with the teaching of the holy prophet those who disagree may refer to sahih bukhari's hadith number 148 in volume 5 book 58 now i come to another uh denial that may come from the other side that would say that well first of all there is a context there is a context of war here and then uh, the terrorists interpretation of islam is not the right interpretation there are also other interpretations which say other things but let's say you talk about your own faith let's stay, uh, talk about hinduism now there is a pandit there is a maha pandit who says something and there is just a passer by on the street he says something into about hinduism whom will be you rely upon is it not the pandit whom you will rely upon is it not the scholar now look at each of these terrorist organizations jaish e mohammed is headed by a maulana al qaeda you know i have met very few people very few muslims who know about islam as well as ayman al zawahiri does he is a scholar he is not just a doctor he is also a scholar in islam the head of isis islamic state of iraq and syria he was an islamic scholar there are so many uh, terrorist organizations that are headed by maulanas and maulvis how can anybody in his right senses say that i know islam better than them so this this is coming from very scholarly interpretation and as i said earlier that the places i picked these citations from are all run by muslims one is quran.com the other is corpus.quran.com none of them is yahudi or hindu they are all run exclusively by muslims and not even ex muslims they are still practicing muslims and uh, whatever is written in these websites is vetted in separate uh, phases so after it goes through one phase of vetting there is another phase of vetting and finally what you see in these websites is what can be called the critical edition critical edition means it is now vetted by scholars across the board and there is no doubt about the authenticity of this so think about this now i come not only to you know i was talking about the girl child so far even boys must know this because very often we see whether it is a street brawl 
or whether it is a quarrel or a debate inside a college canteen or inside an office canteen. There are boys, there are men who even when the women try to be on the right track, they try to lead them astray. So the boys must know that this is their fate in case their territories are captured by a community that considers that and our entire community enemies. So it says that, as I read out from the Hadith that was cited by Tehrike Taliban Pakistan, that in case there is a situation of war and your side gets defeated, this is how, this is the fate that you are going to meet because their religion sanctions that you be killed. Women be taken as sex slaves and men, boys, young boys, be either employed in bonded labor or be killed if they have crossed the age of puberty. Now, when I uh, brought this up in Twitter spaces, uh, there was a person who said, who wanted to believe in what I was saying, but uh, raised uh, a little objection, saying that these are situations of war. That is when I reminded him of Srimad Bhagavad Gita. I asked, why do you think of all kinds of situations? You uh, see that normally when a pravachan is given, when it is time for uh, you know, a religious discourse, you normally have a guru sitting at the Vyaspita and you have disciples listening to him. Why did the backdrop of Srimad Bhagavad Gita not have a similar environment? Why is it the battleground of Kurukshetra? It is so because God, Bhagwan, is telling us that life will not give you an opportunity to relax at leisure and think about these things. Your life is constantly a battle. And in that battle, you have to be ready with this gyan that Bhagwan gives in Gita. So it is always a war, at least for them, a person who continuously targets 15 to 20 girlfriends, all from the Hindu community, it is a war for him. For you, it may not be. He is absolutely not in the doubt that it is a war. It's a cultural war. It's a civilizational war. And the next thing that uh, comes in the form of uh, objection is that there may be some rare cases where the Muslim man really loves the Hindu woman. Let's talk about that as well. Let's talk about all the advertisements you see uh, of commercial products where love jihad is promoted, where, uh, you know, whether it is a Tanishq ad, whether it is a Surf Excel ad, any ad where this idea is promoted, uh, you will see that there is a certain pattern. And the pattern is followed by Bollywood as well. In any interfaith coupling, the man will invariably be Muslim and the woman will invariably be Hindu. It's not the other way around. And if it is in case the other way around, you must also note that there are a few members of the Bollywood bandwagon who are you know, ideologically tilted a little towards us. So uh, they may show such things. For example, uh, Pankaj Kapoor's films, you had, uh, Shahid Kapoor playing a Hindu or Sikh and uh, you know Sonam Kapoor playing a Muslim in the film Mausam. Very rarely you will see that. Mostly you will see the PK type, PK type films. So, uh, uh, and uh, then of course, uh, let's answer the question. What if the man genuinely, let's say not, it's not fake, genuinely loves the woman. Even then, we know that you know, Mansoor Ali Khan Pataudi did not kill Sharmila Tago. So uh, Saif Ali Khan did not kill Amrita Singh. He did not kill, uh, you know, Karina either. So what about them? So first of all, Bollywood is not an ideal model for our society. You see all sorts of things there. If you look at Salman Khan's family, you will also find her sister marrying a Hindu man. So let's keep that aside. That is one thing. But even despite all this, who is the final side? Which is the final side that wins? 
even in the case of genuine love, they are going to raise Muslim children. And when they raise Muslim children, what happens? The demography of your country changes. So this way, by capturing one Hindu woman, even if it is out of true love, they ensure that their numbers proliferate. This is a very essential point. Uh, and there are uh, several other things that can be said about uh, uh, Islam, very diabolical and very different from anything that any other religion says, barring certain interpretations. This is uh, the next part, which is that some of the so-called regressive parts of the Quran have been inherited from the Bible. That is another thing. For example, Islam and Christianity's attitude towards the LGBTQ community. That comes from the Bible. Quran did not invent it. But then Christians say that we have, you know, we have grown over that. We have left that behind. We do not believe in that. Muslims cannot ever dare say there is even 1% of Islam's teachings that they do not believe in. So if they do, they are not recognized as Muslims. If you go to uh, you know, any Muslim neighborhood and ask around, do you recognize Javed Akhtar and Shabana Azmi as Muslims? They don't. They call them, they refer them to as derisively as Nachne Gane Wale. That is, the, that is the kind of respect they enjoy in their own community. Their political arguments may be very convenient for them, but as far as uh, you know, listening to them on what Muslims should and shouldn't do, nobody listens to them. And they also use another uh, uh, you know, subterfuge, which is to say that we are atheists. Now, in any uh, kind of setup you will see in across all communities, there is a section that identifies as atheists. It does not matter because their political position remains what Muslim position is, regardless of their lack of faith in Allah. Does an average Muslim and Javed Akhtar differ politically? They don't differ politically. So how does it matter that Javed Akhtar does not believe in Allah? It does not. We have had such people across communities, as I said, our own uh, towering icon of Veer Savarkar did not believe in God. But he is a Hindutva icon. Khushwant Singh used to say that going to Gurdwara is a waste of time. And yet when Operation Blue Star happened, he severed his links with the Congress because he held the Indira Gandhi government responsible for that. So regardless of not believing in Adi Granth or not believing in uh, your Ek Omkar, whatever the Sikh religion says is the ultimate God, he identified, he related to his community. So that is what matters. Do not let a, a, an atheist ever tell you that, okay, you, may, you must consider me a neutral party just because I don't believe in God. Not believing in God does not give you political neutrality. That should be very clear. So, uh, you know, uh, I was told that uh, I can speak for 35 to 40 minutes. I think it is about time. There's a lot to speak. I'll just end with the thing that despite all the bias that you see on Google and Wikipedia, when you try to look for any facts, still, whatever leftist censorship allows you to read, if you have even that much of knowledge, that is enough to scare you about Islam. Just go through, uh, for example, there is something called war verses in Islam, in the Quran. There is an article on that in Wikipedia. If you just read that and you know what kind of a medium Wikipedia is, so uh, you will get alarmed enough to prevent your children from being victims of love jihad or killing of the kind that happened in Peshawar and all other kinds of uh, uh, you know, uh, atrocities that we witness today. Sometimes they spit in the food uh, during lockdown. 
they made it a purpose to bring people from the most affected, most infected countries, from China to Kazakhstan, to a masjid in, uh, in Patna. And that, uh, that entire crowd just dispersed themselves, although they were visa holders who had to report regularly. They just disappeared in thin air so that COVID spreads across India. They are doing all this on purpose. They, are, they wish to annihilate the world that is not Muslim. Either capture them, either fight a war with them. If you cannot, if you are not confident of winning a war against them, then take recourse to such evil, sinister means. You know, penetrate them through diseases uh, or, or just try to wreck their economy. Uh, you know, collaborate with China as Pakistan is doing. Any which way, you should uh, consider this land to be Darul Harb, a land for war. And uh, until this becomes Darul Islam, the war will continue. Namaste, Surajit Ji. Um, I have a question because I love to listen with an open mind about Islam because I haven't read the texts, but I listen to people who are Muslims, ex-Muslims, and other Hindus who have studied, people like you who are explaining things as well. I have a matter of confusion because some Muslims are saying that, like just like you mentioned, that the text says certain things, different people are interpreting it in different ways. But then you explain that there isn't much context there to have different interpretations. So I get your point. But then there are some Muslims who are also very scholarly, open-minded, who have themselves come on Sangam Talks before and have seen them on Twitter talking about how after their Nabi passed away, the texts themselves were altered by Muslims who wanted to vest power in their hands. And those people um, were exploiting other Muslims and as globalization happened, exploiting other communities as well. So I'm just wondering, how does that fit in with what you have explained because um, if the texts have been changed for um, people like Islamists and jihadists to have power in their hands, then they are telling people, if you don't believe this text, then you're not a Muslim. And that's how they keep the power. But if we stick, stick with the reality, we have the best chance of protecting ourselves because reality doesn't change. So if we, if we know that, okay, the texts were initially there, they were explaining certain things, but then they have been altered. And the current texts are giving all these messages which are harmful to everyone. Then that way we can, I guess, address the situation better. I have got it from my answer. You can figure out if I'm able to explain uh, it to your satisfaction. First of all, the Quran is unalterable. It is sacred and it is holy for Muslims for the basic fact that it is the word of Allah. Nobody has the authority to change even a letter or a diacritic mark anywhere in the Quran. This argument still holds somewhat for the Bible because the original Torah or whatever text was received by the previous messengers of God or so-called messengers of God was noted down in Hebrew. And ancient Hebrew did not have vowels and diacritic marks. So anything that you see in the Bible may be an alteration. This does not apply to Quran that is written in Arabic because Arabic did not undergo any such change for the past, you know, so many centuries since the seventh century. Now, if they are referring to the Hadith, I've already said that the error margin in Hadith is 3,500. It is plus minus 3,500. So 3,500 things that are attributed to Muhammad may or may not be true. But that is why I quoted from Sahih Bukhari. Any scholar that may have come on Sangam talks cannot challenge Sahih Bukhari, he cannot be a bigger authority than that. So, and then finally, if they are still convinced that they are right and the terrorist interpretation of Islam is wrong, why are they telling us, go tell those Maulanas and Maulavis who head these terrorist organizations, have a Shastrath with them. You know, it is they you are supposed to convince, not us. 
because they are spreading all the mayhem across the world. Go and have a scholarly exchange with them. Can you? They don't talk to you. They'll just sever your head. Because the moment you say even a percent of uh, any part of Islam, you do not believe in, you are the enemy. You are no longer a Muslim. That is what is happening across the Middle East, barring Saudi Arabia. You know, Syrians, Syrian victims, Iraqi victims, they are all Muslims. So Muslims are butchering Muslims. Why? Because ISIS believes that even if a fraction of Islam is not adhered to, the person becomes an enemy. So th this is where we are. First of all, I'll, I'll just summarize my ans answer again in three parts. They, these scholars that you referred to could not have referred to the Quran because Quran is unalterable. It is the word of God, their God, Allah. So no human being is entitled to change anything. And if they insist something has changed, then it is no longer respectable. Because unless it is coming from Allah, on what basis is any Muslim believing in it? Secondly, if they are talking about the Hadith, they cannot be more authentic than Sahih Bukhari. And uh, you know anything, all these horrible things that I cited from the Hadith are from Sahih Bukhari, they are authenticated. And there are a few other uh, scholars of Hadiths also. In the uh, slides that we showed, if you go to Quran.com or corpus.quran.com, you will get several interpretations of both those verses and none of the interpretations is mild. They are all pretty radical. So you don't say that, all right, you know, I have a latest version. If you have a latest version, you must take it up with the authority of Saudi Arabia and tell them that, you know, these websites are uh, running a misinformation campaign. We wish to correct it. Don't take it up with Hindus, Christians, Sikhs, uh, uh, Jains, etc. Because uh, why are you convincing us? We are not killing people. And uh, <laughs> finally, uh, yeah, challenge them. Ch uh, don't uh, tell us we are getting Islam all wrong. Um, I guess my only thing, and I hope I can explain this clearly. I'm, I'm a little confused today. <laughs> Had a bit tough day. I guess what they are saying is that, let's say there was an initial text were there. I don't know whether they were unalterable, but they were the word of Allah, they say. And then they are saying that certain Muslims took control of them, changed them. And then they said, this is the word of Allah and you cannot change this. And you have to follow it to the T if you have to be called a Muslim. And so now that is being continued. And the Muslims who are looking at that and following that, they're following all the wrong advice, which is causing harm to everyone instead of following the original text. That was the question I was wondering, but I guess I see your, I, I totally agree with everything you explained. I that may add something Aditi, that is there are uh, of course different denominations in Islam and also different kinds of uh, believers. So uh, the Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan that I talked about, the proponent of the two nation theory. Uh, in fact, he used uh, this theory. He proposed this theory before anybody else. Uh, and yet he is not loved and respected in Pakistan because he did not entirely believe in Islam, which comprises three pillars of faith. One is Quran, the second is Hadith, and the third is Sharia that I have not even come to. You know, Sharia is the legal code that they adhere to. In India, in the absence of uniform civil code, the civil cases, uh, of Muslims are governed by the Sharia, uh, which uh, is referred to also as Muslim personal law. So uh, Sharia is something perhaps they can question, but people like Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, who are referred to as Ahl Al Quran uh, by uh, you know in Arabic and Ahl Quran in Persian and Urdu, uh, they are not considered fully Muslim or not even Muslim by those uh, who, uh, you know, stick to every word of what has been written. So Sharia, of course, is a legal code and legal code they do not even claim was made by Allah, but they say it is in consonance with what is written in the Quran and the life of life and speeches of Muhammad that are compiled in the Ahadith. 
and therefore uh, you know that is the legal code that they should go go by so uh, that if they are questioning that then maybe we can still have a dialogue we can still have a debate over that but there is absolutely no uh, question that anybody changed even a diacritic mark from quran it is not permissible it is not permissible if they are saying that they are not being truthful just one more thing uh, you know regardless of any number of denominations and belief systems within islam there is not even a single muslim in the entire world who does not believe in the quran there may be people who say we don't believe in the sharia there may be people who may say we do not believe in many of the hadiths but to be a muslim the basic requirement is belief in quran you cannot defy quran and still call yourself a muslim which is why i based my arguments mostly on quran and only on on one of the verses i went to hadith narsman here so probably one question uh, what i had was was probably many pockets of india has many muslim liberals per se so is it because of education and if it is education is this the way how this problem can be tackled there are two possibilities in case a muslim identifies as a liberal either he is genuine or he is faking it right in case he is genuine the day the demographic change is so much that another pakistan is created what is the status of a liberal in a country like pakistan does anybody even care to listen to voices like that of asma jahangir let's say in pakistan she is a very well known activist a liberal uh you know this bollywood guy that i named javed akhtar had he lived in pakistan what would have been his fate so in case the person is genuine he will either not get any audience once the uh, you know taking over happens as it has happened in afghanistan very recently and if the person is faking it what he or she is doing is basically called al taqiya taqiya is another sanction from uh, you know religious sanction for muslims where you are entitled to pretend you are entitled to lie you are entitled to any kind of uh, deception to make the majority believe that you are with them and continue with this deception till the time the environment does not become conducive to reveal yourself so in either case you are you know uh, you are in deep trouble uh, if you consider him authentic he has no value once islamists take over your territory and if he is inauthentic then of course why should you believe in that person at all you mentioned how um parents and uh, children alike must um, be very careful of how uh, they respond to coexistence with people of an ideology that uh, we don't quite understand and hence it's very easy to hide under the garb of being liberal because they live probably in a locality where there are the minorities um but i do think however institutional recognition of love jihad is way more important and a lot more effective because um it was only in this case that shraddha knew that his name is aftab amin in several cases you see that they come with uh, hindu names um and hide their identities and it is after several years of marriage that they get to know about it so what we really can't do much in cases um the question is that uh, sir don't you think it would be a lot more effective um if there was responsible vocal assertive reporting as well as institutional recognition of of love jihad as opposed to um upbringing because i feel um whatever little india does know of uh, the muslim track record is because of the upbringing and the institutionalization of india has been rather irresponsible in the same you are absolutely right and the thing of most utmost importance is an institutional approach which is conspicuous by its absence uh, but at the same time we appreciate the constraints under which 
government of India or any Indian state works. And therefore, it cannot say things that I am saying. It cannot, uh, you know, even make laws. You can see that all the BJP rule uh, states, I think by now there are four of them that have a law against love jihad. None of them mention the word love jihad. So uh, clearly it is, uh, you know, the state is wary and we live in a kind of world that will hound us uh, if, if we, if, you know, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, to the extent that he uh, tries to be Hindu, he is so hated by the liberal world, by the woke gentry, and of course, Islamists predictably, and communists who have got a very, uh, uh, you know, an alliance of convenience with Islamists. You do not find uh, Muslims thriving in a communist country. You look at what happens to Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang province of China. At the same time, you do not hear of Communist Party of Saudi Arabia. But the moment they both find themselves in a country ruled by a third power, which is neither communist nor Islamist, they gang up together, form a coalition to uh, constantly harass and heckle the government. So uh, this is the kind of world we live in and therefore the institutional approach will always be muted. What however is, uh, you know, uh, uh, slightly uh, gives, uh, raises hope is the attitude of police. I find that at least in these uh, states, the moment such an incident is reported, the police take it very seriously. Uh, they may not issue official statements saying a Muslim has done this to a Hindu. They'll not do that for very obvious reasons. But nevertheless, they de deal with such cases very strictly. And then you come to the next part, which I keep reminding people that you must consider it love jihad, even if there is true love. And, you know, actually no jihad in the mind of the Muslim man, because ultimately the Islamic community is benefiting from an increased population. Even if they have two kids, it means one Hindu woman taken and that gives rise to three Muslim individuals. That woman becomes a Muslim before nikah. And then if they have two children, they are raised as uh, Muslims. So it is Muslim population, which is increasing. What you can do in such a case, when you find that the government, what can be a larger institution than government? You see that the government is handicapped beyond a point. It cannot be politically incorrect. Then it has to be a samajik andolan. It has to be a social movement, social awareness, and it is happening. I am seeing this in so many places. Take for exam example, our little economies around our neighborhoods. What do we find today? You go out of the house to, uh, for any kind, looking for any kind of vendor. You want an electrician, a carpenter, or you want a plumber. Most of these guys are Muslims because Hindus in the lower strung, uh, lower rung of society are moving to other vocations, more profitable vocations, and Muslims are wasting no time in occupying the void. And therefore, what do we see now? It is so heartening to know. Just recently, I've been referred to at least three app makers who on purpose and by very, uh, you know, exercising due diligence, they look for Hindu uh, performers of menial jobs. So uh, you contact, you want a service from a Hindu worker, a Hindu carpenter, a Hindu plumber, a Hindu electrician, you will get that. So people are rising. Modi did not ask them to do this, but they are doing it nevertheless. So this, this is happening. You know, the greatest thing about the current government is that it's a wonderful catalyst. For those who may not be, uh, you know, aware of uh, the jargon of chemistry, a catalyst is an entity that does not take part in a reaction itself but it facilitates the reaction. So this is a wonderful uh, catalyst. 
that is inspiring people to be Hindu. And people are rising. We know a, such a successful movement, Ram Janmabhumi movement. It was a social movement. It was not institutionalized. People united in the name of Lord Rama. Bhagwan Rama, I should say. Lord sounds so Christian. And, and uh, you know, think about how carefully the person who must have conceived this Andolan must have thought of it. Look across, especially the vast expanse of Northern India. How do people greet each other? Ram Ram, Jai Ram Ji Ki. So Ram is a name that unites people. It's a name that evoked such response, such tremendous response from teenagers who gave up their lives in the hands of policemen of Mulayam Singh Yadav. So we can do it. Uh, not always institutional approach or uh, government approach is needed. My question is, uh, I, I think I'll, uh, I'll make two points uh, on that app thing. Uh, you know, even I have uh, taken some initiative. Uh, Aparna ji knows about Vyavsai uh, Upanishad, the handbook for small business owners, which I have written. And based on the uh, practices which I have recommended in Vyavsai Upanishad, I am creating a directory of uh, small business owners of all kinds, netic.org. You know, I mean, uh, the directory part is uh, being coded right now. So, netic.org, something like the apps which you mentioned, will be available uh, sometime soon. So it will be a uh, it will be a directory as well as a, a training system for small business owners as to how to do small yet progressive yet ethical business, you know. And uh, of course, there will be a marketplace for uh, such people also, you know. So it will be a, a very comprehensive solution for uh, our uh, our side of uh, you know economy. Uh, my question to journalist Das Gupta ji is. You know, it's a matter of content ultimately. You know, I mean, uh, uh, such a uh, deadly content uh, in the name of uh, the particular book, uh, the first uh, category of books. You know, I mean, the Q, uh, the Quran. I mean, with all respect for all the religions and all their holy books. Uh, I mean, uh, such a uh, you know, I mean, it's uh, it's openly known now that there are there are, there are, uh, you know very harmful components in that uh, book. How? Can circulation of this content be restricted? You know, I mean, I'm uh, I'm putting a possible thinking question, and uh, on the sideline, I heard uh, if I if I'm correct that uh, I think somewhere in Gulf, one of the countries has uh, done some editing in the old version of Quran, and they have come up with some new. So, I mean, uh, the the question basically is that you know the institutionalized weakness is one side, but then if something is harmful for the humanity in general. At the global level, are the institutions uh, as weak as we are uh, in, say, for example, India because of both the communist and the, uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 the Islamists playing together? So uh, there are uh, two parts of it. First of all, dismantling a religion is not easy. It of, it's often very violent and it takes years, sometimes centuries. So let's consider some very distant religions and how they were wiped out from the face of the earth. Today, if you go to Norway or Sweden, from where the Vikings came, and you ask them what was the philosophy of their ancestors' gods, Odin, Freya, Thor, etc., can any Norwegian or Swedish guy explain that? No. We know of so many Greek gods, we know of several Roman gods, inspired by the names of Greek gods, which was the previous civilization before Romans. And that Greek religion, that Roman religion no longer exists. Why did they disappear? Because unlike Hinduism, you know, the similarity between those religions that Christians refer to as pagan religions and Hinduism, I never call Hinduism pagan. It's a very disrespectful word. Is, is that there was no driving philosophy behind those gods and goddesses. They just existed as mythologies. Uh, there was, unlike Hindu uh, ritualistic practices, there was no well-defined, uh, uh, you know, a mantra, a mantra siddhi, no tantra, nothing. 
which is why when organized religions evolved in the order of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, it was very easy for them to dismantle these pagan religions. The same thing happened during the Spanish invasion of Latin America. You have, other than some archeological remains, there's nothing left of the Aztec civilization or the Mayan civilization. Because once again, while they were great architects, they had a religion that was not backed by sound philosophy. You make a, a, a Shastri or a Pandit uh, face Zakir Nayak, for example. I'm not talking about Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. He just messed it up royally. But you know, a good, uh, a good uh, Shastri, Will he be defeated in a, a religious debate with uh, Zakir Hussain? He won't be. Because we are, our belief system is based on very sound philosophy, which is why you see that when it looked like the globe was divided or cut into two pieces of a big melon, as if Christians and Muslims had decided amongst themselves, you expand westward, we will expand eastward. So the Christians went westwards up to Latin America, up to North America even, and Islam started expanding eastward, but was halted in India. What is remaining in India today was their first stop. Despite such relentless effort, we only see, thankfully, that Muslims only have a scattered population. And farther east, you go to Thailand, Singapore, Towards, move towards the North, China, North and South Korea, Japan, except for Malaysia and Indonesia, Islam did not reach anywhere. So this was the first resistance offered historically to Islam. That is one thing. Now coming to the next question, how do we do the same to Islam? What Islam did to, let's say, pre-Islamic pagan religions of Arabia? Once again, I'll I'm actually not comparing, but I'm trying to inspire people with the talk of Srimad Bhagavad Gita. The unique factor about Bhagwan Krishna is that he is as good in intellectualism as he is in war. And that is something that Muhammad could take inspiration from. He could fight, he could also argue. Both the virtues were there. Today's Hindus are good enough only for arguments. Very few are left for fighting. It is not going to be a bloodless coup. There is going to be a war and it is already on. So there are two things constantly keep shaming them about the horrible things that are taught in their religion. And what is done in that case? Let's say I give you a book. You consider me a holy master. I give you a book which is full of lies, full of deceit, full of horrible, disgusting things. Will you believe in me? No. You will shoo me away. So what do I do? That answer is given within Christian, Christianity and Islam. They have a concept called Satan or Shaitan. What does Shaitan do? What does a Satan do? It pretends to be Allah. It pretends to be God says lots of nice things. In between, he intersperses the course with his real agenda. That is how Islam spread. There are lots of good things written in, written in the Quran. No doubt about it. Good things written in Hadith also, even in Sharia. But those good things are only a camouflage for the horrible things they wanted to push in humanity. That must be understood. Good things, what are the good things? They are shared by all religions. Do not tell lies. Be good to your parents. You can even be an atheist and still believe in these things. You don't have to be a Muslim or Hindu or anybody. You can be good to your friends. You can be loyal. It, it also says knowledge is so important that, that you know, he, Muhammad tells uh, fellow Arabs, Knowledge is so important that in search of knowledge, if you have to go, if you have to walk up to China, then walk up to China. So consider the geographical distance between Saudi Arabia and China. And in those days of transportation and communication, 
So there are good things said in that, but those good things are camouflages. They are a way to deceive you into believing we are giving you something very good. Otherwise, if, you, if I just, let's say, approach you and say that I have a new religion, it has a God which asks you to beat your wife. <laughs> will you accept it? You will not. You will chase me away. You will perhaps get me beaten up. But, but then if I tell you, you know, there's wonderful things, be good to everybody, etc., etc., And then I hand you over a thick volume of book in which let's say on page number 389 or something, I have written something awful. But then I also tell you, if you believe in Allah, you have to believe 100% in this book. This is how it was marketed. But I repeat again, a war is inevitable. You have to be as good with the discourse of the Gita as with Sudarshan Chakra, metaphorically speaking, of course. So, so then if you keep harping on it, maybe in a century or two, the world will change. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, just adding to beat your wife gently, I have uh, studied this in some detail and it means that you can beat her with a stick, but the, you should not disfigure the face. Gently means do not disfigure the face. Don't yeah, she should angry. keep looking beautiful so that yeah. she does not lose her sex appeal. Right. That is the point behind it. Also, I have a friend whose mother was abducted in 1947, being a Sardarni from Amritsar, but uh, abducted and married to a Muslim. So the daughter is now a Muslim and he's, she's a friend and she's a practicing Muslim, married twice. And um, she, she does tell me that there are very clear hadiths for, for wives. They can be beaten if they don't obey you. Uh, they can be beaten if they refuse sex. They will not refuse sex to the husband because if you refuse sex to the husband and he goes to bed angry, the angels will curse you till morning. Uh, so, and, and if you do not obey uh, or, or if you tr try to leave Islam, you will be hung upside down in hell by your hair. So, you know, there are all kind of things that women are conditioned to because we were wondering, I, I was wondering, how come in love jihad it is not the other way around? It is never the Muslim women who are the victims. Uh, maybe just a last answer. Yes, yes. Uh, Aparna ji, your uh, question and uh, Arvind ji's question have a kind of similar answer. Why or how did Islam become so successful in spreading? Because the world was controlled by men and Islam is misogynistic. It suited men. You know, there is no religion as misogynistic as Islam. It gives the man complete control over his household, over his uh, love life. And uh, therefore, the woman does not have a say. Even in the part where uh, Islam is gentle to a woman, for example, the, in your citation, do not disfigure her face. Why? So that she keeps looking attractive to you. And uh, her appeal should not get reduced. Things like that. If they had been uh, a bit more scientific, they would, would say do not kick on her belly, for example. It may kill a child inside or uh, some, something like that. But just think about the objectification of woman. It is asking you to spare her face. She should look good, even after being through your brutality. So uh, it, it worked. Men thought that this was very good. In the name of God, women will completely submit before us. 